Okay, so as promised, let's look at uh, the problem of counting prime numbers, and this is the main topic of this course anyway. So let's see where we go from here, and we'll slowly bring in zeta function and start studying its properties. So the motivation for this is simply the following question. given an x how many prime numbers are there in the interval 1 to x. Uh, this has been around for a long time sort of fascinated a lot of mathematicians uh, who tried to uh, come up with some formula capturing this number of primes and uh, pretty quickly people realize that there does not exist any nice formula for this, because the prime numbers seem to behave very randomly. And so, any sort of nice formula expressing exact number of prime numbers in this interval is not likely to exist at all. However, it was again observed and particularly by Gauss, who did huge amount of calculations about number of prime numbers in an interval that there is definitely some pattern here. In fact, what he observed was that the number of prime numbers are very close to x by log x. They are not exactly equal to x by log x, but are within a small distance away from x by log x. And this was pure numerical you know, hand calculation at that time there were no computers. So, he used to in all his spare time it is said he used to compute tables of prime numbers and then he would based on those calculations he made a conjecture that this is Conjecture. Well, it was made in some different forms by others also, but it was very specifically highlighted by Gauss. So, if we denote by pi x the number of primes in the interval 1 to x, then pi x tends towards x by log x as x goes to infinity. So, it is not equal to, but tends towards which is another way of saying that limit x goes to infinity pi x over x by log x tends towards 0, not 0 tends towards 1. Okay, so, that is the conjecture and that conjecture motivated a lot of interest around that time, which was early 19th century. Um, and uh, Riemann, who was a student of Gauss, spent uh, quite a bit of time studying these prime numbers or the density of prime numbers as it is called. And uh, it was he as the name we have been looking uh, thinking seeing is that it was he that came up with this connection of the density of primes with this complex analysis and the zeta function and everything else a lot of things other things. Like he wrote a very small paper about 11 12 pages long on which was on counting 
prime numbers or on the density of prime numbers, in which he laid out this whole program, you know, he defined the zeta function. It was still around earlier also, but there is a complex variant of the zeta function he defined and then studied the properties of it, made the connection with density of primes, made the Riemann hypothesis and derive the conclusions of Riemann hypothesis, just about everything he did in that small paper. And it is there, I will I mean at least the translations of that paper are there on the web. It is very interesting read, all of you should go and read it. Okay, so, let us trace back the thought process of Riemann from we will not follow completely that, but more or less. And at many points in this uh, sequence that I am going to tell you, a sequence of steps that I am going to tell you, uh, you will realize that several of these steps seems to be like pulling a rabbit out of hat. There is no a priori justification as to why are we doing this or how did this idea come about. And that was the genius of Riemann that he just came up with so many new ideas in that paper that it is very hard, it will be very hard for me to give you a intuition or justification why this idea is being used. We will realize the use of that idea only when we apply it and do the calculation and see yes it does work. In fact, that is the nature of all great mathematics mathematical ideas, they are all very simple and they all seem like pulling a rabbit out of hat. Okay, so, and I will try to point out those ideas, at least from my perspective things that I do not understand, I will try to point out, I do not know why this, how this came about, but it has come about. Okay, so, let us go back and we are interested in this prime counting function which is pi x. So, let us spend some time on this, the pi x is all primes in the interval 1 to x, let us write it more mathematically and that can be done by writing something like this. That n going from 1 to x and let us write here a notation which would mean p sub n okay, where p of n is 1 if n is prime. 0 otherwise. Okay. Now, this is a sum going from 1 to x, which is a, a variable quantity. So, it is a finite sum not even terminating uh, at a fixed point and uh, analyzing this sum is and especially given the quantity inside which is also not very nice it sort of seems to be 1 and 0 at if primes are sort of somewhat randomly distributed it is 1 and 0 with some random uh, probability then uh, it becomes easier to analyze if we can transform this finite sum to an infinite sum, because then at least we do not have to worry about up to what point do we have to sum up, we just sum up all the way. Right. So, at one problem is taken care of, the problem of p n is still there, but at least the sum n problem is taken care of. So, how do we translate this from uh, to a sum? Uh, from up to x, this is sum to up to x, how do we translate this to a sum up to infinity? It is a very straightforward idea that I can write it as n equals 1 to infinity p of n 
times delta of uh, x by n, where delta of m equals 1, if m is between 0 and 1, 0 other. simple just take a delta function there and you have the infinite sum. Here just to be careful uh, I should be saying that this is between m is between 0 to less than equal to 1, because x can be an integer and I want to sum up to that. So, that is nice that instead of finite sum now I have infinite sum both the limits are well known, At, but the penalty I paid is I have introduced another funny function delta here multiply which is multiplier to p n which was to begin with not so easy function to analyze, but then just recall last lecture this delta we have a nice for handle on we can stick in place of delta ok, where are we? P n and what can I write for delta x over n? If you recall what was that function? It was 0 between 0 and 1 and then it would step up to 1 all the way. The delta function that I want is should be 1 between 0 and 1 and then go down to 0. So, that is different slightly different one that I want. So, you just look at yeah 1 minus or n by x let us change by n by or delta hat n by x n by x if uh, x is bigger than n no. I think there is something wrong here I think I think we already had it correct yeah. delta m the here should be 0 and here it is 1. is delta x by n and here if n is less than x then you want it to be 1 as long as n is less than less than equal to x which means as long as x by n is greater than equal to 1 you want it 1 as soon as x n becomes bigger than x you want it to become 0 and therefore that is so we already had it correct so now let's invoke that previous theorem and we can write this as now who remembers that integral it was 1 over 2 pi i integral c minus i infinity to c plus i infinity x to the, now x is now x by n x to the s by n to the s and let us know that we are treating with let us write it z, because we have been typically writing z for complex numbers and c is greater than 0. Yes, so I have to be careful here, so at, at exactly 1 this does not quite fit in and when do when does this take value exactly when when x equals n so n is always integer so as long as i say that x 
is let us say half plus integer which is fine. I can always count number of primes between 1 and x where x is half plus an integer that number if I can do that I know the number of primes everywhere so that is not a problem. So, this is just a simple technical point which I can get around by fixing x always to be half plus integer and that is what we will consider now and forever x is half plus integer. Okay. Now, as it turns out that this is fine I can use this, but this is not quite what we would like, because uh, see why are we trying to do this, we are the if I put it in this formulation now I have a complex integral. So, I will try to see our what is our goal is to estimate the value here right. Now, that I have written it in terms of a complex integral. I will use all my complex analysis information to evaluate that complex integral and we saw some examples last time and on all of them the way we did was we want to evaluate the integral on some curve or line. We fix a domain whose one of the boundary is this say line then put other lines there and then use the call this residue calculus formula to see evaluate the integral along that entire boundary of the domain. Then we say that on all the boundary that we are interested in that we leave aside and all other boundaries we say it goes to 0. So, we can ignore that and therefore, we get this integral of the kind we want right. So, that was a strategy and that is the strategy we are going to use here because that seems like a natural one to do. It. But if I put my line on which I am integrating as going from minus infinity to plus infinity, then I do not have a, any definition of a domain that in my way. For defining a domain in a proper way, so that whose boundary is well defined, I need to limit this integral to a finite curve, it cannot be an infinite line. So, that is fine instead of this I can write it as we all in fact, we did evaluate this integral c minus i r to c plus i r x to the z divided by n to the z z d z and then there was an error term associated with it. How much was that? x to the c by r log x. Okay, by n and here also you get x by n. So, I should replace this by Now, let us continue with our simplification of this. The integrand inside is an analytic function. Okay. Moreover, as if you look at this. Okay, let us me write it down and then I will justify this.
Okay, I am writing it this way. Second part is clear. I mean, that's just a sum. We separate it, take the input. But here, what I've done is I swap the summation integral. And the reason why I can do it is because this sum is uniformly convergent for absolute value of z greater than one. Why is this uniformly? Okay, first of all, if this is uniformly convergent, then sure you can swap summation integral. We have seen that. So why is this uniformly convergent? What do we need to show that this uniformly convergent? So even if P n yes, if P n is always either zero or one. So as assume P n is all ones. So what you get is there is zeta function there. That's a zeta function. And although we have not seen that zeta function is uniformly convergent, so let's just write this. Uh, by the way, what is the condition for uniform convergence? You take a finite any finite sum and subtract it from the infinite sum, take the absolute value that the difference between the two is a, a value which goes towards 0 as the length of the finite sum increases. So, let us say if the length you take n equals 1 to infinity p n by n to the z and subtract it from n equals 1 to m minus 1 p n over n to the z and look at the absolute value. This is less than equal to absolute value n going from m to infinity p n over n to the z. This is less than equal to summation n equals m to infinity p n is at most once always. So, it is 1 by absolute value of n to the z which is n to the c. See z in this integral is going from c minus i r to c plus i r. So, we only look at the real because absolute value you only look at the real part if it is in the exponent. So, it is c and that also tells me okay, let us first do this and then we will come back to this. So, it is n to the c, c is greater than 1 well not we do not know, but if c is greater than 1 then what is this sum. Yeah, this sum you can approximate it as integral m going to infinity 1 over t to the c d t right, is within some constant factor of this and this is t to the uh, minus c plus 1 by minus c plus 1 m going m to infinity and this is the place where we use the fact that c is greater than 1. So, the second part of this is 0 and the, this is therefore, 1 over 1 minus c 1 over m to the c minus 1. Okay. This is if c is greater than 1 and now you see that this is absolutely uniformly convergent, because as m tends towards infinity in the which is the as the approximation of your sum increases this tends towards 0 irrespective of the value of z that you take. Okay. So, that settles the fact that this sum is uniformly convergent. But 
we need c greater than 1. Remember original sum for the delta function was valid for any c greater than 0, but this uniform convergence is not true for any c greater than 0, we have to assume c greater than 1. Okay, so, from henceforth we will assume that c is greater than, otherwise you cannot say, otherwise you, you sorry how does that help? Okay. Is your question that why is, how does uniform convergence help in switching, is that what you are asking? How to switch, because you can show that the result without the switch and result after the switch they are both equal and the way to show that is that your question okay so if and the way to show that is i think i briefly mentioned earlier is to look at okay let's take this specific case so that you look at this integral c minus i r to c plus i r Okay, and one to m pn by n to the z x to the z by z d. Okay, so this is the finite sum inside this, and let's call this S M. Okay. Now, what we know is that this surely is equal to n equals 1 to m integral c minus i r to c plus i r p n over n to the z because it is a finite sum. Right, so, it is a integral of a finite number of terms, which by we know by standard integral theory that this is the sum of the integrals. Okay. So, this is fine. So, now let us look at the yeah, let us look at S infinity minus S m that is equal to Okay, and this is less than equal to this by uniform convergence is 1 by order 1 by m to the c minus 1, we just derived. So, this is a order 1 by m to the c minus 1 times this integral c minus i r to c plus i r x to the z by z d z right and this integral is equal to what we know what this integral equals it depends on whether x is less than 1 or greater than 1 depending on that it is either 0 or 1. So, at most 1. So, this is really order 1 by m to the c minus 1 right. Well, right. Now, use the fact s in what is s infinity? It is the integral inside the sum, no sorry the other way, the sum inside the integral. So, I am not writing the stuff here, that is s infinity. 
minus S m was that finite sum inside the integral, but we know that is equal to that sum n going from 1 to m of integral. This is equal to order 1 by m to the c minus now take the limit as m goes to infinity the right hand side goes to zero what happens to the left hand side well this is fixed there is no change to this this tends towards this takes it towards that's infinite sum followed by integral and their absolute difference is zero so this says that integral of sum is equal to sum of integral. And we are done. So, the uniform convergence is critical here. If we do not have uniform convergence, we do not get this. Okay, so, is, does that convince you the uniform convergence? So, now coming back to this, we have uh, this uniformly convergent for c greater than 1, and this is allowing me to swap the integral with sum we get this inside the sum and now if you look at this this is well not quite zeta function zeta function had p n equals 1 everywhere but some close cousin of zeta function right so this gives you an idea that yes here is a integral complex integral with something like a zeta function sitting inside times x to the z by z which is was the integrand of for the delta function and you integrate this on this line minus i r to plus i r at c greater than 1. This integral is equal to the number of zeros from 1 to n up to this error term. Okay. So, now we have two jobs well more than two jobs with us, but immediate two immediate jobs are first to see what cousin of zeta function this is right because I want to get some handle because this p n being sometimes 0 sometimes 1 I do not even know exactly where it is 0 where it is 1 that is not a very good function to analyze cannot really if I start ask you know querying about the properties of this we will probably get stuck. We want some nicer function here. So that's one very important requirement. The second important requirement is to estimate this error term, because if this error term is too big, then again we will not be able to say much. Okay. Now, as it turns out, so by the way, here already is this beautiful idea of. Uh, translating this finite sum to the infinite sum with the delta function multiplying and which is written as this complex integral. So, this connection between the complex integral and the prime count is established right here and this is a beautiful idea and which, which is not at all obvious I just um, a incredible insight which led to this connection. Okay. Now, as it turns out that this particular sum p n over n to the z is not uh, amenable to expression in expression as a nice enough function. So, although the goals were very laudable we started with pi x and did manage to establish this connection we cannot really make too much progress from this point. 
So, we have to restart, restart it does not work. Okay. So, what the problem is that pi x is um, is a messy very messy function to handle. So, what we and then we are trying to connect pi x to some cousin of zeta function which is does not seem feasible. So, we do the next best thing we start with the cousin of pi x and try to connect it with some cousin of zeta function. So, at least two levels of interaction and then it works. Okay, so, here is a cousin of pi x. and it is called psi x. It is a sum of 1 n going from 1 to x of lambda x sorry not lambda x lambda n where lambda n equals log p if n is p to the k for prime p 0 otherwise. Now, pi x had p of n which was 1 precisely when n is prime otherwise it was 0 this is slightly more uh, uh, not general it is it is a function which is non zero at more points at every prime power it is non zero and it is non zero with value log p where p is the prime of which we have a power okay zero also so you can see this is a close cousin of and as it turns out uh, these two are very very tightly related. And in fact, there is a theorem which I am going to prove not today, because today the task is to connect this with the complex integrals, but this theorem is interesting in its own right and it was proven by Riemann in his paper as well. That uh, The psi x is pi x times log x, which is sort of you expect because at every prime, instead of uh, one, there is a log prime that way. In fact, every prime power there is. So this kind of relationship one can suspect that psi x would be roughly pi x times log x. But what is somewhat unexpected is that the error in that relationship is very very small. This error is at most order square root of x. Okay, this point is clear. So, which this tells us that if I can get a good estimate on psi x, we got a good estimate on pi x. Whatever is the estimate for psi x divided by log x, that gives a very very good estimate of pi x as well. So we restart the whole thing with psi x in place of pi x. So, now psi x is summation n going 1 to x lambda x lambda n sorry this is same as summation going from 1 to infinity lambda n delta x y n this is summation n
right. I think this expression is right. And again I can interchange this is for c greater than 1 just to make the thing work right from the beginning. And so let us not worry about error term for the moment. Let us look at the main term. After exchanging the integral with sum, we get this. And now this the cousin or the assumed cousin of zeta function is this. The only difference of course, is that instead of p n we have lambda n here. Okay. So, how does this get related to zeta function? This is how. What is zeta function? Zeta of z is this, and we know that we can write this as product over all prime p. We did this long time ago, and uh, one over. 1 minus 1 over p to the power z is that right yeah that's right because this expresses it as a geometric series and then we can get it but now that we are started worrying about convergences we have to see that this is also convergent this product and uh, well requires a bit of an argument what you can see in the not too difficult that as long as the absolute value of z is greater than 1 this converges nicely this equality holds. So, let us stick this condition that absolute value of z is greater than 1. Okay. So, that is a zeta function. Now, if you look back at this lambda n the way it is defined it is 0 whenever n is not a prime power. So, this sum is actually only a sum over prime powers okay. in fact uh, same was the case with uh, summation n p n over n to the z that was only a sum over primes, whereas in zeta function this is sum over all n's. So, to convert zeta function as a sum over primes this gives a clue zeta is a product over all primes. So, how do you convert a product into a sum standard way you take log. But now this sum has all these funny creatures log logarithms sitting here. You want to get rid of them. How do you get rid of them? Again, standard take derivatives. Differentiate left hand side, what do you get? Zeta prime z over zeta z. Differentiate this side, what do you get? What is the derivative of this? 
1 minus 1 over p to the z. Okay, so this is well 1 is of course goes away then there is a minus here and then differentiating 1 over p to the z that is e to the minus z log p you differentiate that you get minus log p out. So, minus log p and the rest stays the same p to the minus z divided by 1 minus 1 by p to the z. Okay. Any problem? Okay, what is it you don't follow? How do you get this? Okay, let's see. Let's go step by step. Differentiate log, you get one minus one by p to the z. Okay, now you differentiate the insides. The insides, well, one goes away, so you get minus, and then you differentiate one by p to the z. That is e to the z log p, by e to the minus z log p actually. So when you take derivative of that with respect to z, you get minus log p popping out, and e to the minus z log p remains e to the minus z log p, which is which is same as p to the z. Okay, so that for you get some minus some I'm taking minus outside, some over prime p's. And then you get log p at the top because that minus minus becomes a plus, and here you get p to the z here. So you get I write it as p to the z one minus one by p. To the z. Now I express one minus one by p to the z as a geometric series. Sum over prime p. log p times y p to the z of course, and then this geometric series which is j going from 1 to infinity 1 by p to the j z. Okay. Or is it 1 or this goes from 0 to infinity. right? And there is a p to the z sticking outside. You multiply take it inside. All that happens is that j starts going from one to infinity. You get this. Now, what is this sum? Look at this. It's running over all primes p, running over all j, going from one to infinity, and the number inside that you look at is p to the j. So, this is essentially running over all prime powers. Sum over all prime powers, and the inside is log p divided by that prime power raised to the power z. Therefore, this is precisely this. Got it. So that's that's precisely the cousin of uh, uh, pi x that we defined. Of course, this is also an inspired idea to consider psi x instead of pi x, and it just fits in perfectly. Uh, so, let us uh, go back to this and write the 
therefore, psi x is 1 over 2 pi i c minus i r c plus i r and inside the integral, the integrand is this we know exactly what this is. This is zeta prime over zeta is minus of this. So, minus zeta prime over zeta then x to the z by z d z plus this error term. So, this looks very good, this is now in a very nice shape the complex integral. If you can handle the error term and go to nicest get a nice bound on the error term, then we are right on track to estimating psi x, because that all we need to do is to estimate this integral and we know tools to estimate this integral. This is on a line we will choose an appropriate domain, integrate over the boundary of domain, use Cauchy's uh, theorems to get the integral value and then try to make the other boundaries of domain go to 0 or become very small if not 0, because we are willing to tolerate some error in the estimation anyway. There is already some error here in the in this part, there is already some error. Right? So, there is already some error here in this part. So, even if there is an error estimating the integral that is fine. All right, clear to everyone. So, we have established this that is enough for today and uh, next time our first task will be to get a handle on this error term exactly how large this is. Okay. Naturally, it will be a function of r and uh, we want to get it to make it as small as possible. All right, any questions? And once of course, we get a handle on this then we get down to integrating this function inside.